Namaste. Welcome to Urban Chatterati. And today we have with us Varun Javari, who is the ex-OSD of Aishman Bharat, where he played a critical role in building up the world's largest healthcare scheme. Varun, welcome to the show. Namaste, Abhinav. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I think it was a lo- long uh, planned session and I'm finally glad we are able to record this. Thank you for taking out time, Varun. We know that you have left Delhi now and Delhi is a bit missing you, you know, but I think Ahmedabad has, uh, the loss of Delhi is the gain of Ahmedabad now. <laughs> Probably. Let, let's hope for that. <laughs> okay. So, so Varun, let's start with our discussion on what is happening right now with respect to this pandemic. We are seeing a second wave, which is far more dangerous, far more, uh, you know, uh, I'll say uh, damaging than the first wave. How do you read the second wave? Well, I think uh, what you said that we are encountering the second wave, I think there are, of course, there are various reasons for that. One is the fact that, uh, you know, right after the introduction of vaccine, I would say there was a natural uh, sort of uh, laxacity in the behavior, uh, you know, from all of us. And, you know, once the number were going down, we really thought that, you know, the pandemic is getting over. And uh, probably for, you know, two to three months, we saw, you know, quite a positive results in terms of, you know, constant decrease in the numbers. So, you know, the type of hygiene and the type of social distancing that we were following in the first wave, uh, that, that gradually kept coming down. Second thing was, uh, you know, of course, we know that because of the lockdown, the economy uh, had suffered quite a bit. Uh, so even if you look at from the state government's perspective, you would see that there were, uh, you know, a lot of measures which were actually put in place, which uh, really did not follow a lot of social distancing norms, like you know, opening of the markets, not following those particular norms, or not even ensuring that, you know, the citizens are following those norms. So I, I think that was also a second uh, key factor. The third thing, and this is something that we are seeing across the globe, is that there are also a lot of mutations which have happened. Uh, so, you know, whether it is a muta- mutation that happened in UK or South Africa, or even something that is happening in India, I think because of that, uh, you know, as we know in the virology, a virus it keeps increasing its strength by mutating. Uh, and unfortunately, that is also something that we're witnessing here. Uh, so I think that is the third main reason that because there are so many several mutations which have come across, uh, you know, this particular second spike that we are experiencing has come out so early. Uh, I think, you know, in and all, if you, if you really uh, look at it, uh, I think the non-adherence to, uh, you know, the social distancing protocols and uh, you know, the type of uh, declining standards that have happened in hygiene. I think those are probably, you know, the most important reasons behind, you know, such a surge that we are seeing in the second wave. Yeah, uh, but when it comes to social distancing, we have elections yeah. going on wherein we can't do anything about it, where people like us can't drive without masks in a car in Delhi. So I, I think it's, it's a problem which is uh, beyond our control, how to maintain social distancing, because mm. it's, not possible for most of the people to maintain social distancing. Let's also acknowledge that we are a bit privileged, we can maintain it, we can stay at home, but Mm, the majority of the population just can't do it. But, you know, coming to this vaccination part of uh, the pandemic, India has rolled out the world's largest vaccination program. There are lots of criticism regarding it, regarding the, uh, the ACE bar, which has been put in there, that only 45 plus can get vaccinated. There is criticism of uh, exports of the vaccines from India. Then there is criticism from the states like Maharashtra that mm. they are being discriminated against. The, the center is not giving them the vaccine. Uh, what's your take on that? Uh, well, you know, Abhinav, there are various facets to this. Uh, but, you know, let's, let's try to uh, really understand what are we, you know, looking here. Uh, what we are looking here is it is the world's largest vaccination program that has ever happened. Uh, you know, vaccinating more than, uh, you know, 1.3 billion citizens. That is, of course, you know, an, a, a very Herculean task. And, you know, if I have to go to the fundamentals, what exactly is a vaccine? You know, I think that is a question that we have rather stopped thinking about or even, you know, stopped discussing. Uh, but if you look at the fundamentals, as I said, a vaccine is a sort of a shield that helps 
in ensuring that the symptoms that you get after an infection are not aggressive enough that you have to go and get hospitalization so in a way we need to distinguish here between infection and disease the vaccine it does not stop the virus from entering the body but what the vaccine can do is that it can help the body give a better immune response to that particular virus uh, and what you know how this really helps is that because of that you know better response you do not need to go and get hospitalized so there are two particular objectives one is that it reduces the overall mortality rate and the second is that it reduces the burden on the overall health system these are the two clear objectives of getting vaccinated now let me pick uh, you know the first point that you mentioned about the cascading approach that we are taking uh, and the approach you know that we are taking is is not something that is unique to us this is something that every country has done whether it is us uk sweden uh, and this is also something most of the you know uh, health organizations most of the health research suggests that when you need to start vaccinating start with vaccination of those who are at the highest risk because if you do not get them vaccinated first then what will really happen is that they will start ending up in hospitals and they will start uh, uh, you know putting a lot of pressure on the health system and finally the health system will crumble so the only problem that has really happened with us uh, is twofold one is that you know we have a large population so you know going from one phase to another it takes time unlike you know unlike the us uh, or unlike the uk because for them you know if you look at 45 plus you know doing a one month vaccination they can you know they can shift to the uh, you know the lower age group but we cannot do that because you know we have almost you know 30 plus crore of citizens uh, you know who are who are currently in this particular age group of 45 plus so it, it takes time and the second uh, uh, which has happened is is with regard to this inception of the second wave if you look at you know the three months which were there where the cases were not rising no one was really even interested in the vaccination you know there was not enough demand the media was not covering the awareness was going down and everyone uh, you know was basically in a in a in a sort of a utopia that you know the pandemic is over and we do not really require vaccines so uh, you know this is this is really why you know the vaccine debate has really started getting very aggressive these days and it is now occupying the center stage which for me should have always occupied uh, but you know it, 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 the three months that passed Uh, where we did not see those sudden spikes. That, they, that they, really, they were mocking the yeah. vaccination drive. Lots of yeah, people absolutely. were mocking the vaccination drive, saying government yes. is wasting money on it. Correct, and you know, not even vaccination drives. Even if you look at wearing masks, uh, you know, very eminent lawyer today, Prashant Bhushan, uh, you know, he has posted about you know wearing mask. It does not help. Rather, you know, it causes mental discomfort. Uh, you know, when such type of uh, you know eminent people they they post such type of things, which completely is in contradiction with the science uh, you know th- th- that that gives major repercussions to society and even if you look at uh, you know what what really happened is that think about when the bharat uh, biotech co vaccine was given mm-hmm. an emergency approval you would realize that every media outlet across the country as well as you know a lot of them who have their outlets running in new york uh, and you know the uk uh they were discrediting india for giving the emergency approval to uh, bharat biotech covax they were like you know this vaccine is not required you know we do not have uh, you know enough trust on this particular vaccine uh and these are the same people who are now talking about the shortage of vaccines and they are saying why are you not getting more and more vaccines so you know in in a span of 90 days uh you know the entire narrative has completely mm-hmm. changed uh so Uh, you know we can we can dive more into it but this is you know my initial response with regard to you know uh, the age wise strategy and the type of dynamics which are associated with the fundamentals of vaccination but you know there's another aspect that uh, the lockdown has caused severe economic distress and we again have this night curfews restrictions mm-hmm. threats of uh, lockdown again in the states like maharashtra so the argument goes that you don't do not need to vaccinate people who are above 60 let's say in a small village or a small town because the risk is much lower you should be vaccinating everyone in the metropolitan center because those are the people who have to go out and work let's say someone is a 40 year of age let's say he's not 45 plus but he has to take care of his parents he has to take care of his children and if there's a job loss because of night curfew lockdown whatever 
these people mm. are going to suffer so why not allow vaccination for all in the hot spots not in the entire country let's say mumbai delhi pune you allow it for all and for the other you can keep doing what you are doing i think you know the the main reason behind that is that then the criteria will become very less objective right now if you look at you know the criteria is so objective that it is very easy for anyone to understand that if you are 45 and above then you go and get a vaccine the thing is that if we have a dynamic criteria uh, then it becomes very difficult you know it is very difficult to understand whether i am in a micro containment zone whether my block is in a, a micro containment zone or not and then really what happens is that if you know if if you are prioritizing people in the hot spots then you will see all the people in that hot spot queuing up for vaccine so that itself is a bigger threat uh, and, and the other thing is that you know if you look at what the government has recently come up with the notification they have said that if there are more than 100 beneficiaries in the target group uh, at whether it's a workplace or whether it's a residential society then the government vaccinators will come there and set up a camp so you know leave apart the the deficit the supply the government is pushing for measures which can increase the demand uh, so you know this whole uh, particular approach and of course you know it can be tweaked from time to time depending on what exactly is the status but you need to come up with an approach which is objective enough it should not create confusion amongst the beneficiary hmm. if you look at you know when even uh, it was a lockdown this whole red uh, yellow green zone it used to create so much confusion uh you know because it's a dynamic thing and for a simple person who does not have the access to that type of information you know he doesn't know which zone is in he doesn't know what the what are the restrictions where he should step out where he should not step out so i think the objectiveness of the criteria is really important and it really helps in giving out the right information to the citizens uh, interesting point so objectivity and simplification of the criteria yeah. not yeah. like those notifications coming out yes. of the pandemic by our steam bureaucrats which no one could understand what they are writing but you have worked you you were in the ayushman bharat last year when this entire pandemic thing was going on what was going behind the scene how was government preparing for it what was the thinking thought process going on uh, at the level of the policy making if you can oh uh, yes of course i can i can reveal the you know the broader strokes uh, so how really you know the the whole management of the pandemic really happens is that you know central government is of course you know the nodal authority for the larger policy making so it sets out you know broader guidelines it charts out uh, you know what are some of the protocols that can be followed across the country but that is really you know probably 20 or 30% of the overall management the real management that happens is at a state district at a block level so you know there is the state machinery which actually uh, you know takes care of implementing those guidelines and you know center has been quite flexible on almost all occasions that the state and the district it should decide on its own what type of implementation and you know what are the measures that a district or that a block has to take uh, so you know similar sort of an approach was followed that the center used to come with the guidelines you know give flexibility to the states uh, uh you know to to impose to impose whatever particular measures they think is uh, relevant because you know what really happens in rajasthan is going to be very different from assam and it is much better that you know the the, the rajasthan government decides for rajasthan and the assam government decides for assam at the same time center was doing a lot of uh, you know technology like providing a lot of technology support the arugya setu app uh, you know that that came up you know the whole uh, improvement in the test testing capacity that was happening we were doing a lot of uh, you know collective procurement like if you look at you know the test uh, scripts uh, you know the type of uh, you know testing capacity which was improved the type of uh, swap capacity which was improved uh, you know the pp uh, imports which were done so a lot of collective uh, bargaining a lot of procurement was happening at a central level and then it was getting distributed at a state level then you know we were making a lot of training manuals for actually uh, helping the doctors understand what are the clinical protocols to be followed at a hospital level uh to manage patients uh you know there are there a, what what really happens in covid is that you know you get a similar set of patient with different symptoms with different intensity of the symptoms so how the doctor should manage how the doctor should give a priority in terms of you know the person with the intensive symptom to go and have the icu so that process is called the triaging so the central government was giving out guidelines in terms of the triaging there was a lot of interministerial coordination which was happening 
with your ministry of civil aviation ministry of foreign affairs ministry of textiles again you know for ensuring that restrictions are put in place uh, if there is any particular imports which needs to be done you know that that is happening uh, so a lot of i would say heavy lifting uh, you know in terms of the citizen management was happening at a state level but a lot of uh, you know focus on creation of a backbone uh you know whether it's the technology whether it's the education uh whether it's the information was actually happening at a central level so and you know one aspect is specifically with regard to the awareness part from prime minister you know to the asha worker everyone was spreading awareness so you know whether we call, talk about the janta curfew or whether we talk about uh, you know the thali bajao campaign uh you know the diya jalao campaign for me all of them are tremendous examples of how to really spread awareness uh in one day you know the prime minister he announced this particular campaign and every single citizen of the country knew that there is something which is happening in the country uh and i think that is that is you know one of the global case study which should be put out there that how really india you know managed this particular information awareness campaign with regard to the pandemic yeah uh, indian politicians are an expert in communication with the public no one can deny that <laughs> so and this is this is something very interesting because this is why democracy succeeded in india because yeah. despite having such a large population of uh, illiterate people the political parties the politicians were able to communicate those sophisticated thoughts to the people interesting yeah. part but uh, there were lots of criticism regarding pm cares our mm. setu covid nap which is still ongoing how do you rate the success of these initiatives the the aryog setu the covid app and then the pm cares well uh, if you look at let's try to understand what really happens in a crisis what are the two major criteria one is the timeliness and second is the relevance uh, so the solution that you are uh, you know crafting out it needs to be made as soon as possible and second is that it needs really needs to be relevant so if you look at arogya setu uh, you know the arogya setu app uh, itself you know was such a huge success in terms of uh, you know really helping citizens identify you know first of all whether the symptoms that they have you know they correlate with the covid symptoms or not because it is very difficult for a you know any normal citizens to understand whether the symptoms that he has they are covid like or not so first of all arogya setu helped in that second is that it really helped in understanding that the area that the citizen is living in how many cases has that detected uh, so as in when you know more users started coming on that particular app you know the the insights started getting better and better and this is not something that only india has done a lot of countries have you know uh, embarked on this particular journey and it really helped in uh, you know first of all testing your symptoms and then tracing whether the you know uh, the area has similar sort of citizens with similar symptoms or not and finally with the treatment so you know whichever citizens they are fi- they are found to have this particular symptoms if you know arogya setu used to give you that you know you are at a high risk or you know you should contact your nearby doctor and based on that a lot of state helplines a lot of central helplines used to call you whether you got your test done you know whether you have got admitted if you have higher symptoms or not so arogya setu was really instrumental in that uh if we talk about the covin platform uh and this again brings us to the you know the whole vaccine uh you know discussion one thing which is very important uh that we you know again it is not getting discussed is that it is not only about the supply of vaccination which determines your vaccination rate it it is also about how much infrastructure you have to vaccinate people so when we when we really talk about this point what 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 i mean is that how many vaccinators do you have in that region what is the type of cold storage do you have in the region uh, you know what is the type of training which has been given to the vaccinator so it is a typical supply chain it is very easy for a government to say here are your 100 vaccines but if i just have one vaccinator it becomes very difficult for me to really vaccinate and this is also a problem that you know uh, that has been faced a lot uh, a lot of states they really do not have that type of robust store, uh, cold storage they do not have enough vaccinator so even if the center gives more vaccines to the state that would not convert to vaccination 
rather you know that would convert either to wastage or black marketing so mm-hmm. you know you need to be very rational with regard to that coming to the covin platform what really the covin platform helps in doing is first of all it provides an interface both to the citizen as well as to the vaccinator to have a common uniform uh, platform as a citizen i can go enter my details understand whether i'm eligible or not see the nearby centers and get an appointment the second thing that it helps uh, you know the vaccinator is that it helps the vaccinator enter his or her details enter the details of the citizen scrutinize the records that the uh, you know the, the citizen has filled uh, verify the documents that the citizen has brought with the filled records and finally when everything is done help that particular vaccinator enter the details of which vaccine was given when was it given what was the name of the vaccinator and finally the most effective thing that you know again is not there in the discussion is how india is giving a digital vaccination certificate yeah. uh, you know think about this in the future you know without a vaccination certificate if you want to access let's say uh, you know airways or railways or any particular movement or uh, you know uh, mode of movement how will the authorities know that you know you have actually got a vaccination done and you are safe to travel so you know this is this is i would say uh, one of the great by product of the india's digital transformation the vaccination certificate so you know and that that is uh, happening through the covin platform uh, the one more thing with that happens in the covin platform uh, is that you know now a lot of private hospitals have also started uh, you know vaccinating citizens against a price of 250 rupees so they are also able to use this covin platform and through that the government can actually track that how many vaccinations was done and through that you know the government is able to understand that this many vaccines were sent this many uh, uh, you know vaccinations have been done by the state so this is the type of waste and based on that you know they can actually rationally uh, distribute vaccines depending on the population of the state as well as the wastage factor so that is with regard to the covid platform uh, mm-hmm. with regard to the pm care i think what uh, what, what really happened uh, with the pm care was that uh, you know the awareness and the on the and the information education with regard to the uh, you know the legalities of the pm care i think that came a bit late so that created a lot of confusion uh, but you know very recently i was also hearing the rajasthan health minister who said that they have received 1000 ventilators you know from the uh, amount which was deposited in the pm care so i think the amount is really getting used in a lot of activities requiring strengthening of health infrastructure and even if you look at a lot of hospitals i have visited a few delhi hospitals where i have seen uh, you know a lot of ventilators which have been supplied by the pm care and i'm sure you know this would be a trend in other states also i just feel that you know uh, the government had to do more work with regard to making everyone understand what is the legality of the pm care uh, and i think that was one area that you know they could have probably done uh, you know something better on that i i think pm cares is a better institution than the previous one where you have the political yes. party members being the member of the committee here you have all yeah. the government people right so yeah absolutely and you know pm nrf giving out money to the rajiv gandhi foundation oh. uh, you know i really never understood what was the connection in that uh, and rajiv gandhi foundation gives out money to people like kanchale yeah <laughs> yes and that is that is such a sheer conflict of interest Uh, that the pm nrf you know giving out funds to rajiv gandhi foundation uh, it, it really uh, is is not something that you would see in a democracy like india but no the question is that is india democracy perhaps we can have a different discussion on that varun some other day yeah. but uh, uh, coming to the work done by the modi government in the last 7 years hmm. you have been associated with the ayushman bharat you have seen the things up close let's say how would have the thing uh, look like if uh, the pandemic came in 2013 or 14 compared to today uh i would say india would have been at a way worse situation uh, than what we are right now uh, i i will tell you why number one part that you know the government has really focused a lot is creating a very very strong digital backbone uh and one of the example that i want to give you is with regard to the you know the jam trinity the jandhan aadhar and the mobile trinity imagine if we did not have that in place when you know the pandemic came and when we had to do a lockdown how how would we have done any dbt transfers 
how would we have sent uh, you know the funds directly to the beneficiaries account it wouldn't have been possible uh so you know if if the pandemic would have arrived and uh, you know people uh, you know, and the government would have thought of a lockdown the government had absolutely no way to really transfer the money in people's account people would have left to starvation and that has not happened if you see you know the type of measures that the government announced in terms of you know directly uh, you know giving out money uh, you know to people's account helping increase the ration uh, during that particular time uh you know the pm kisan scheme uh, where you know 6000 rupees were directly deposited a lot of that is only possible because of the digital transformation that 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 was really uh, that really took shape in 2015 16 17 so that's the first point the second point is that schemes like ayushman bharat you know when david uh, uh, ayushman bharat was launched in 2018 which is world's largest healthcare program which really protects uh, you know more than 500 million citizens against catastrophic healthcare expenditure so during a pandemic what doesn't stop is your uh, you know non communicable diseases and you know your non pandemic related services that a person require uh, what what does that mean is that you know during a pandemic it's not that i will stop suffering from a liver disease or i will stop suffering from a heart uh, bypass surgery uh, you know the demand is pretty much the same uh, so imagine if there was no ayushman bharat during that time first of all you know the economy uh, food you know economy of course has got the slump but along with the slump in the economy the person would need to go and pay for the treatment of that particular heart bypass surgery in ayushman bharat uh, you know the scheme which covers uh, expenditure for uh, you know more than uh, 500 million families with a 5 lakh cover it covers more than 1000 procedures so without that uh, you know the type of vulnerability and the type of uh, exposures that the citizens would have had uh, you know that would have been deplorable the third thing is that think about the more than 1000 medicines wherein there is a price capping so what what uh, you know the, the government has really done is that there are around 1100 medicines on which the price has been capped and these are you know the commonly used medicines uh, and this medicines you know the charge for those medicines have to give you, have to be given by citizens and if the capping was not done again you know it would have caused such an economic burden the fourth thing which is a very uh, you know uh, interesting one is with regard to the increase in the human resources that has happened in the the last 6 years uh from 1947 to 2014 we had 381 medical colleges okay from 2014 to 2020 the 381 has become 565 so a uh, increase of more than 50% mm. so imagine you know without the medical colleges uh, the availability of the doctors that we see it is impossible to have you know those many doctors really entering the health system even when we talk about the mbbs uh, you know 58% seats have been increased hmm. in the mbbs itself and you know with regard to the post graduate around 70% seats have been increased so think about that you could have had uh, you know your hospitals but you know you would have doctors which are way lesser than what we have right now and finally the point uh uh with regard to you know the medical colleges in the last 6 years india has commissioned more than 6 aims across the country so you know again aims being super specialty hospitals you know being medical colleges it is such a hub of uh, you know medical excellence that now it is opening across different tier 2 tier 3 cities so the type of health infrastructure strengthening that has happened i think that is something which is uh, you know quite quite noteworthy and i feel that if we would not have this many things we would have definitely suffered you know way more than what we are suffering right now i i agree i think the work done by the uh modi government in its first term actually paved the uh, way for lots of things jabbing being done during the pandemic yeah. the jam trinity but you also talked about this price cap on the medicines mm. and all mm. and we have seen lots of criticism regarding that especially in the mm. case of the stents in the heart surgery that imposing the price cap basically caused a shortage do you think that was the best way to go about it rather than let's say let the government buy it from the at the market price and supply to the people rather than 
imposing a price cap on the product itself. What has been the overall impact of this policy? I think with every policy, you know, there are always two views. One is a short term view. One is a long term view. Uh, I think what this government has been very successful is sacrificing the short term uh, losses for long term gains. And to be honest, that really takes a sort of a very bold appetite to have that form of governance, because what it really means that you are thinking long term. Uh, even if you look at other, uh, you know, some of the other things like GST, you know, again, short term losses versus a long term gains approach. So when we talk about the prices of stents, uh, let's see what really happened. Uh, the stent industry was primarily dominated by uh, manufacturers, uh, you know, like the foreign manufacturers, uh, to give an example, you know, someone like a Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and, you know, that, that industry was something which was really... Uh, you know, capturing both high volumes as well as high cost. What the government really did was it created this price cost and it led to two things. Of course, in the first, you know, five to six months, because the industry uh, had suffered, you know, such a sort of an intervention, of course, you know, there was shortage. But in the longer term, what really happened is that it has given rise to a lot of indigenous Indian manufacturers of stents. So if you look at the industry right now, you will see that the market share of the Indian uh, uh, stand manufacturers has really increased. And I, I think that's a very positive uh, sort of a growth. The second thing is that the model has really shifted from high volume, high cost to high volume, low cost. So, you know, rather than doing a sort of an extreme profiteering, what has really now started happening is that, you know, you sell a high volume, you sell at a low cost and you make, you know, whatever is a decent relative profit. So in a way, this is a sort of model which has benefited the citizens who have to purchase directly. Uh, second is the Indian indigenous manufacturers who produce this tent because it gave them that uh, you know, sort of a boost. And the third is the government who has to also procure stents for a lot of schemes, uh, you know, such as Ayushman Bharat and all. So it is a sort of a great intersection but it really requires a government which can stand the pressure of the lobbies because you know this is again you know a huge lobby you know so much pressure comes on the government why are you reducing or why are you capping the price of the stand but a government which can really think about the citizens benefit and the country's benefit in the long term i think that is the type of approach that we need in this country yeah. so do you think that this recent uh, uh, ruckus about allowing the other vaccines in india is also the work of certain lobbies uh, well, I would not, you know, perhaps go vaccine by vaccine, but, uh, my understanding is that, uh, you know, right now serum has a capacity of manufacturing around six to seven crores per month. And, uh, you know, now they're, they're trying to expand it and same with, uh, you know, the Bharat biotech, I think they are expanding from, uh, 5 million to probably, you know, uh, 15 million, uh, my understanding is that if the wave keeps on moving and if the curve keeps on increasing and if the states are equipping themselves with more infrastructure, that is the states are saying that I am ready to vaccinate, you know, collectively, let's say 15, uh, 5 uh, million citizens every day. Right now we are doing around 3, 3.5. But if the state says that I am ready to manufacture, I am ready to vaccinate, you know, uh, 5 to 6 million citizens per day, but that needs to come from the states. They need to show the capacity, you know, both in terms of cold storage, in terms of the human infrastructure, in terms of the vaccination camps, everything. Then at that point of time, I think India needs to, uh, you know, understand if there is a demand supply gap, if the current uh, supply that we have, that is not going to meet. And, uh, you know, based on that, you know, I think a decision needs to be taken rather than, you know, randomly saying that, you know, tomorrow we need this particular vaccine because that, that's not how it works. Mm. Again, the, you know, there is more complexities that any vaccine who wants to enter India, it requires the approval from a subject expert committee. And that approval can only happen after, uh, you know, proper clinical trials are done in India. Uh, so a lot of vaccines I know, you know, uh, are, are doing their clinical trials in India. And uh, I feel that if there is a need to increase the pace, I think then we need to start looking at that. But that increase, it cannot be uh, you know, judged only by the central government. It needs to come from the states. 
you know right now you know the data which was released yesterday uh, i think you know there are around 9 9.1 vac- uh, crore vaccinations which were given but at the same time there is almost around 2 crore vaccination which was there in the existing supply and then you know the pipeline is already there so if the stage display that particular uh, accelerator pace then i think this decision can be taken interesting point and this is not being talked about in any of the discussion yeah. in the mainstream uh, but what is my last question to you what is the future of aishman bharat will more and more people be covered under this can we have a universal healthcare irrespective of your income slab and other things also the government has launched this digital healthcare program uh, mission right so what is the future of healthcare in india in general especially from the perspective of the public healthcare i think uh, uh, with ayushman bharat uh, we have seen various sort of a framework which have met uh, you know good success one is how important is the implementation of technology in providing healthcare so if you look at ayushman bharat every uh, process is a paperless and a cashless process everything happens on a digital platform there is no uh, you know manual intervention which is required in the scheme so first is that every particular scheme uh, you know which is sort of a government scheme for the citizens it needs to have a very strong digital component second is the type of engagement of private sector that uh, we have done uh, so out of around 23000 hospitals almost 45 46% of those hospitals are private hospitals so that shows and that really breaks the myth that you know private sector should not be uh, you know blended with the public i i feel that you know the synergy between private and public sector is possible and uh, you know you just the, the public sector it needs to take up a role of a regulator and payer uh, and along with that you know the private sector can be blended along uh, the third thing that we have seen is that in india if you go with a model of a high volume low cost you know it's a very successful model what we have inherently uh, you know kept thinking is that our population our large population uh, you know it, it is a big disadvantage but we have never thought from the opposite side that can we uh, have different business models in place and can we leverage the high volumes of the population that we have to low cost for everything whether it's health education whichever sector it, it is uh so i think that is also sort of relative success that ayushman bharat has started showing in the last uh, almost you know 20 22 months ayushman bharat has provided free treatments to around 2 crore citizens uh and the government has spent you know around 21000 crores uh for this particular treatment so i i say it's a strong start uh you know 32 uh, out of 36 states and union territories are implementing this uh bengal telangana delhi and odisha they are still not implementing it uh i hope you know bengal starts implementing it soon uh and uh, you know i feel that it's a strong start in terms of the future uh, of course there are more people uh, you know who are still vulnerable to healthcare expenditure because ayushman bharat covers 40% and the top 10% are probably you know uh, some sort of insurance private insurance corporate insurance so you still have this middle 50% which we refer to as missing middle uh, so this there is this still 50% which needs to be covered i think it's just about you know the trade off uh, that the government needs to work uh, that you know whether the entire 50% should be covered to the government expenditure or whether you want to cover 20% more and the other can be like a co payment model wherein you know uh, people who are interested can pay some premium and government can probably give you know 10 or 20% some states are doing it uh but i think you know it's it's all it's all going to be about what are those different models uh that we can uh, carve out to go towards the universal health coverage because at the end uh the idea should be that in the next 5 to 6 years uh everyone should have some form of a health coverage whether it's a government whether it's a private whether it's a corporate whichever it is uh so the idea is that you know you do not expose yourself to such type of catastrophic health expenditure so i think this is this is a direction that the government uh you know would, would probably like to start exploring uh with regard to the national digital health mission uh again a very disruptive uh, sort of the intervention it is exactly what uh, you know i would say the upi was for the financial ecosystem and now we see you know the type of crazy burgeoning growth that upi has seen you know we are doing the highest number of transactions by far we have beaten china uh you know in, in terms of the number of transactions so similarly 
the government has realized that uh, you know the healthcare system it requires you know more information symmetry it requires uh, you know processes which are connected uh, you know digitally so what the ndhm really does is that it gives a uniform interface a uniform infrastructure to citizens to doctors uh, you know to hospitals to lab providers such that you know you can uh, start creating your national health id again it's a voluntary thing and then based on that you can start uploading your electronic health record so all those uh, you know old systems of carrying your file from doctor to doctor you know that is something which can be uh, you know which which can be probably uh, thrown out and rather you know this new system can be adopted uh, and at the same time you know the doctor he can see your medical history if you provide the you know relevant consent but the fundamental idea is that the government builds this particular digital health infrastructure and then you know uh, the open apis of this digital infrastructure is provided and on top of that the public and private can build services to the last mile just to give an example upi is a government health uh, is a government financial infrastructure phone pay is a private service which has been built on that but that uses uh, upi mm-hmm. so similarly you know in the ndhm the government builds the basic digital healthcare infrastructure and on top of that the private sector and the public sector also can build a lot of services for the citizens so in a way it is going to be a big disruption in the next 2 to 3 years for the digital health and uh, i i feel that you know at least in the healthcare uh, if we keep on moving ahead with this type of pace and this type of initiatives and and i really hope the pandemic uh, in the curve starts going down very soon mm-hmm. i think the future of india in healthcare looks really strong and that will be something because in india the healthcare is the single largest reason why almost 2 to 3 crore people go below the poverty line every year and that's yes. a huge number that's a huge number but thank you varun for talking to us and i will certainly invite you again to discuss aishman bharat in much more detail for our absolutely. audience perhaps a live session with the audience some day we will plan it out yes absolutely and uh, but thanks a lot for your time varun thank you thank you abhinav thank you it was and great it was a pleasure having and thank you audience for listening to us please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and join the channel and we will be doing more and more live sessions from now uh, i have cracked the code of doing live sessions so uh, hoping to see you during those sessions as well thank you